me to just share what's in my heart, but we talked about how important having the Bible as the way you, you see things through the Bible and through the Word of God. I talked about how that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It's God breathed. People wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This isn't a book by man about God. It's a book by God through man. And that is just critical that you have that belief system. And in order to establish that, we countered uh, evolution because there's a lot of people today that have just taken the the things that are being spoken as evolution is a proven fact, and it is not a proven fact. It's a theory. I believe that there are thousands of scientists that have rejected evolution on the basis of science. There, are, I believe that the uh, evidence proves creation more than it does evolution. And so anyway, we talked about all of those things. And then I started talking about what does the Bible say about the nature of God? And many of us have a wrong impression about who God is of course, because of things in the natural and people that don't know God. But even some things in the Bible have been misinterpreted. And this morning I talked about the law. Or was that last yesterday? Anyway, sometime. It was yesterday. Yesterday I talked about how the law has been misinterpreted. And people think that by keeping the law, you somehow or another earn the favor of God. The law wasn't given so that you could keep it and thereby please God and earn his favor and his benefit in your life. But the law was given to actually make sin come alive and to show you your sin and to make you despair of ever being good enough to earn anything from God. It was to make you turn away from self-righteousness. And yet I believe one of the slickest deceptions that the devil has ever done is to make the church embrace the law as God gave this to me as my path of how to get right with God. No, it was just to condemn you and to show you you can't get right with God on your own and you have to throw yourself on God for mercy. But a lack of understanding that has caused some people to believe that God is this strict legalistic God that unless you do everything just right, he will let you die. He will let anything happen to you because you hadn't dotted every I and crossed every T. And that is not true about God. So we talked about what is the true nature of God and dealt with that. Talked about an extreme sovereignty of God. What I want to talk about tonight is you not only need to have the biblical worldview, a biblical perspective on who God is, but you've also got to understand who you are in order to relate to God. And I'm going to break this into two parts. And tonight I'm going to talk about how, who you are in the natural, in the flesh, without your born again spirit. And I know that most people don't like to hear this, but you need to hear it. Let's start with this verse over in Isaiah chapter 59. This is a verse that God gave me about... 45 or I don't know, a long, long time ago in the very beginning of my walk with him. And in Isaiah chapter 59, that's not right. Where is this? It's right here close. Let me find it. In Isaiah chapter 51, hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Um, Look to the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. You know what this is saying is, if you are seeking to be right with God, you've got to look to the rock from which you are hewn. That's talking about Jesus. That's talking about seeing who you are in Christ would be the New Testament equivalent of this. And to the hole of the pit from which you are digged. You need both of these. You need a revelation of who you are not, or let me say it this way, who you are without Jesus. You need a revelation of your inadequacy. And you need a revelation of who you are in Christ, that through Christ I can do all things. And to most people, these are opposites. And they, just, they center on one or the other. And a lot of people that have been through a lot of condemnation and they've struggled and they've dealt with guilt and things like this, when they hear that Jesus loves them, they just go 100% the other direction and start talking about who they are in Christ and I can do all things. And that is certainly good. We need to know that. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow morning. You need to know that. But it's still true, even for a New Testament believer who's been born again, 
that your flesh is still flesh and it's not good. That in the natural, none of us are anything special. You know, one of the statements I heard this week that really blessed me was Stephen Bransford when he got up and talked and he talked about when a person paints a, a beautiful picture, nobody comes up and says, oh, isn't that a beautiful canvas? They don't talk about the canvas that it's painted on. They talk about the paint and the artist and what he did with it. All we are is the canvas. And all you are is canvas. You aren't anything special in yourself. And I know that there's probably people right here that are taking offense at this because this is another worldview that the world has today that's sad to say most Christians have adopted. And that is that you got to have good self-esteem, positive self-esteem. We talk about this with our kids and, and the way that people try and accomplish self, good self-esteem is to ignore that you have any problems. We don't want kids to go out and compete because somebody might be a loser. We want everybody to be a winner. I remember my granddaughter came home and she had some trophy and my son asked her, says, what'd you get a trophy for? And she says, oh, everybody got a trophy for being a good sport or something. And he took it and threw it away. He says, no, there's winners and losers. And you know what? If you didn't perform, you don't need a trophy. But man, that's not politically correct today. Everybody's got to feel good about yourself. And the only way you can feel good about yourself when the truth is at times you are just an absolute jerk. There are times that you do things wrong. The only way you can feel good about yourself is to say, it's that woman that you gave me, what Adam did. You have to start pointing the thing. Well, you don't understand. The reason I've got this problem is because I was abused when I was a child. It's because of the color of my skin. It's because I don't have an education and everybody's blaming somebody else for who you are. You know what? As long as you do that, you will never be a victor as long as you embrace being a victim. You got to quit doing that and you got to admit that, you know what? I just blew it. I was wrong. And yet today, psychology, I could spend all night on this. I'm not going to do this. I've got a great teaching on this, on harnessing your emotions. And it goes into a lot of these things that I'm talking about right here. But psychology basically has made you have an excuse. If you're fat, it's because you have a tendency to, towards that. It's your genes. And you can't even say fat. You've got to say overweight or weight challenged or something like that. You're just fat. <laughs> You're just fat. <laughs> Did you know I heard today that Amazon, I think it was, I better not say who it was, but anyway, it was Facebook, Amazon, it was one of those things that they literally took down the Declaration of Independence because in there it was regressing, why, it was listing the reasons why we uh, were breaking away from England and among the things that were listed, it says that England was inciting the, the Indian savages to ravish us. And, and Britain did do that. They encouraged the Indians to go massacre and kill. And that's one of the ways that they fought against us. But because they used Indian savages, they took the declaration of dependence off. Our political correctness, they're trying now to declare the Declaration of Independence invalid because it didn't use politically sensitive terms. You're just fat. <laughs> Admit it. But you know, if you, if you would say, man, God, I'm fat, help me, then you start getting over it. But as long as you say, it's not my fault. I can't help it. I just look at food and gain weight. That's a lie. It's a lie. You know, since you were a little kid, anything that's gone into your mouth, you put it there. You can't blame something else. It's not your genes. I can guarantee you, you quit eating and you'll lose weight. I had somebody this morning tell me that they were saying, why isn't this working better? I've still got knee problems and stuff. And he was quite a bit overweight. And he says, I know I'm overweight. That would help. And I said, that right there might be your answer. Just lose weight. And he says, well, how? And I said, take whatever you eat. You can take desserts. You can take candy. You can take anything. You don't have to go on these extreme diets. Just take whatever you eat and eat half of it. Yes. And you'll lose weight. 
And the first thought, well, it'll go to waste. Well, would you rather go it to W-A-I-S-T or W-A-S-T-E? It's going to go to waste one way or the other. Just choose your waste. But I don't care if you say that I just gain weight easily or whatever. It is. I promise you, eat half as much as you eat and you'll lose weight. It'll work for anybody. I challenge you to do it and then come back and say, I didn't lose weight. You will lose weight. Anyway, my point is, see, as long as you say that, well, I can't help it and I'm the victim and this is just my genes. And well, you're always going to be overweight. You're always going to be having problems until you admit that, you know what? I'm just a glutton. You know, I'm still overweight. I need to lose weight. I'm not condemning anybody who's overweight, but I'm about 30 pounds less than I was 10 years ago. And I went out to eat with a woman who I was eating salad, trying to behave. And she was eating a um, chicken fried steak with gravy and French fries. And I was lusting at her food. <laughs> And she was a skinny lady. And I said, man, you just can't gain weight. And she says, I've lost 160 pounds. Not my, I mean, I just was shocked. Like, How did you lose 160 pounds? And, she, and anyway, she gave me a tape set, nine CDs in it. And she says, this will tell you how I lost my weight. And so anyway, I had a nine hour drive from Midland, Texas, back up here after visiting with my mother, and I, I prayed and I said, God, I need a word. I need you to speak something to me. And I said, this woman has seen success. Speak to me and show me what my problem is. And I put that first CD in and I wasn't a mile from my mother's house until God spoke to me. What she said was, she says, you know, weight isn't the problem. Weight's just a symptom of what the problem was. And with her, she was so depressed. She used food to make her feel better. That was her escape. She says, my problem was all this. Well, that wasn't my problem. I wasn't using food as an escape. But when she said that, the Lord spoke to me and he says, the problem with you is you're a glutton. <laughs> and I looked up a glutton and a glutton is a person who eats more food than you need. More often than you need it. That's what a glutton is. I qualified. And you know what I did? Nobody told me. I just started taking whatever I ate and ate half of it. And I don't do it as well as I should. If I did, I'd be thinner and stuff. But I'm saying I've lost 30 pounds and kept it off for 10 years. And it was because I quit saying, well, it's just who I am. This is just the shape I've got to be. No, it was because I was a glutton. I was eating more food than I needed, more often than I needed it. And that's the reason you gain weight. It's the only reason you gain weight. Thank you for this thunderous silence. <laughs> and I guarantee you this isn't popular in our society today because, again, I'm not responsible for this. I can't help it. That's a lie. And this is what psychology has done. Nobody, you aren't responsible for being overweight. You aren't responsible for being a drug addict, to be an alcoholic. It's your genes. You have a tendency towards it. You can't help it. You are a type A personality, and this is just who you are. That's a lie. Well, I, ever since I was a kid, I've had a temper. Well, you, you were born with some demons probably from your <laughs> ancestors, but I can guarantee you God did not make you to have a temper. God did not make you to be a depressed person. God did not make you to be an obnoxious person. Some of you are saying, boy, you need to listen to your own message. <laughs> I'm saying this in love. I'm trying to let you know that, you know, apart from Jesus, none of us are any good. And this really goes against the worldview that the secular world has. The secular world believes that we're all basically good. If we could just sit down and talk to the terrorist and sit down and all sing Kumbaya together, that they would be fine. It's just because they haven't been given the right economic thing. And it's because they have a, a basic belief that man at his core is good. That is not what the Bible teaches. 
Look at this in Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. This is one of the main verses that our founding fathers used to establish the three branches of government. Isaiah chapter, I mean, excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, does that sound like that you are basically good at your core? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Look at this over in Genesis chapter 6. This is when the Lord came down during the time of Noah. And in Genesis chapter 6, and I believe it's uh, verse... In verse 5, and the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. You know, to me, I've never read this verse that it just doesn't touch me at my deepest level to think that God created us. It says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, that for his... Uh, How's that go? Revelation 4, 11. For his pleasure, we are and were created. We were, that means the original purpose, and still God's purpose for us. It hadn't changed, even though we've changed. We were created for his pleasure. God created us to love and to show his pleasure. It's like a parent with a child. The reason we have children, we love our children. We want to bless our children. God loved us, and yet... In a very short period of time, he saw that the, every imagination of our heart, every imagination of our heart was only evil continually, and it repented him, and it grieved him at his heart. I can't even imagine that. If we didn't have a gracious, loving God, he wouldn't have just wiped out the people back in these days. He would have wiped out the human race as a whole. Man, it is the mercy of God that he loves us and that he sent his son to die for us. But we at our core are wrong. And see, this is a lack of understanding. This leads to all kinds of problems, even in the Christian realm, because people uh, think that somehow or another they're really pretty good. God, I don't need you 100 percent. I'm not as bad as this old publican over here. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. I thank you that I'm not like other men. Did you know that all prejudiced, all racial things, all kinds of things like this come because people do not have a biblical worldview of who they are. If you knew who you were, you would have no right to be criticizing anybody else and feeling superior to somebody else. But we have different ideas because a person's born into royalty or something, they think that they're better than other people because you're born on one side of the track. You think you're better. You're comparing yourself among yourself, which I use that verse this morning, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. They comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. Man, if you understood who you really are without Jesus. If you understood how desperate your plight was before Jesus intervened and changed you from the inside out, it would eliminate all of your criticism, your racial things, all of this kind of stuff would be gone. You know, in hindsight, I can see the wisdom of what God did in my life because I was born again when I was eight. But when I was 18... I had gotten to this place that because I was following all of the rules and the regulations and I was doing it better than anybody I knew. I was leading two and three people a week to the Lord and getting them quote unquote saved. I don't know if they were truly saved, but I'd get them to pray a prayer after me and then I'd take their scalps to church and tell everybody, look what I did. Look how many people I saved. It was not about them. It was all about me. But I was leading two or three people a week to the Lord from the time I was 14 on. I led hundreds of people to the Lord in the Baptist church. And I was really feeling good about myself. And then God showed up on March the 23rd, 1968. He pulled back like a curtain. And I saw myself from his eyes, not my born again self, but my flesh. The part of me that I was glorying in, that I was better than other people. 
And I saw myself from God's standpoint, and I guarantee it was terrible. Any person who is bragging about how awesome you are, you do not truly know God. Compared to God, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you think that you are awesome, that you are God's gift to mankind, you have not had much of an encounter with God. I was in Johnson City, Tennessee a couple of years ago, and I had a man come up, and God had used me to touch his life, and he was just over the top. It's okay to be thankful, but he was over the top, like, oh, I can't believe I'm touching you. And he started crying and shaking, and, I, and it was pitiful. And I was embarrassed. And you know what? I looked at him and I said, if you'd spend more time with God, you wouldn't be near as impressed with me. I said, this says a lot about you and about your relationship with God, that you honor a man to the point that he was just about to pass out because he was shaking my hand. If you think that you are awesome or somebody else is awesome, you just haven't spent a lot of time in the presence of God. When you get in the presence of God, I can show you Isaiah chapter 6. When he saw the Lord high and lifted up, he fell on his face. Oh God, depart from me. I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And God had to take a coal and purge his lips and, and call him to service. Jeremiah fell on his face. God, I can't do it. I'm a child. You can just go through every single person when they were in the presence and the glory of God, it relatively, all of a sudden, you realize you are a zero with the rim knocked off. You are nothing without God. And this isn't just Old Testament. Let me show you some New Testament scriptures on this. Mark chapter 10, this is Jesus speaking. And the rich young ruler came to him, fell at his feet. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him in verse 18, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. This is Jesus speaking. There's only one good. You are not good. You in yourself, apart from what Jesus has done, I'll talk about that tomorrow, but you in your flesh, you are not good. And I know that this really offends some people because, again, you've got to feel good about yourself at all costs. You don't need to feel good about yourself. You need to feel good about who you are in Christ. You need to feel good about who you become through Jesus and what he's done. But you ought to, you ought to hate this garment that has been stained by the flesh. You ought to be looking forward to the time like Paul said that, man, we are longing to be like him. Because I know that if I depart this life, I'll be clothed upon with my body from heaven that doesn't have all of these limitations. When you are glorying in your flesh, you don't have a biblical worldview. And I don't care if your flesh is better than my flesh. I don't care if you lift weights and you are a great specimen of a man or if you're beautiful. It doesn't matter if you have USDA choice flesh. If it's flesh, <laughs> it's flesh. Look at this verse over in Romans chapter 7. In Romans uh, uh, chapter 7, or excuse me, that's not where I want to go. That's a good one. I could use that. But let me turn over to Philippians chapter 3. That's where I wanted to go. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking. And in Philippians chapter 3, he says uh, in verse 2, beware of dogs. See, you've got a scripture hanging on your fence. <laughs> beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Man, this is huge. I could minister on this for days and days making application, but I pray that the Holy Spirit will help you see this. One of the biggest obstacles to you being used of God is your confidence in your flesh. Most people think, God, I know why you chose me. What a great choice. I can see the wisdom of it. I'm awesome. <laughs> Man, I'm a great singer. You just get me the audience and I don't need you. I will handle it from here. That is a recipe for disaster. 
You know, one of the things that I love about Daniel and about all of our praise and worship people here is that they have talent and stuff, but man, it's not about their talent. They worship the Lord. Charlie and Jill, they've got great talent. They're great musicians, but it's all about loving God. Their, their confidence isn't in themselves. They aren't ministering to you out of the flesh. They're ministering to you out of the spirit. I know that Daniel teaches this in our worship school, and it's one of the testimonies that I hear often from people. But see, people who are talented tend to trust in their talent. They tend to think, God, no wonder you called me. I can see the wisdom of it. The moment you have that attitude, you do not have a biblical worldview. Now, I'm not, you don't deny that you have talent. I'm not saying that you sit there and say, well, I'm nothing. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. But even if you are talented in some area, you need to give all of the credit and all of the glory to God and you need to minister out of the ability that He gives instead of out of your own ability. I've actually heard people sing back to back that one of them was 10 times better singer than the other person, but the one who didn't have as good of a voice is the one that God anointed and flowed through because they were ministering from their heart and God took that and used it Whereas the other one may have got a standing ovation, but it didn't minister life. It's not going to change anybody. You know, the scripture says over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let me turn over and read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 26, it says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. And here's the reason he did it that no flesh should glory in his presence. God does not want to give you the glory. God said, I will not share my glory with another. And if you take, it doesn't matter if you've got great talents, if you're a beautiful person, if you're a great singer, if you've got great administration skills, if you've got all of these things, but if you are doing it out of your ability, it doesn't work. It doesn't carry the anointing of God. It may please men. Men may like it. They may give you awards, but I guarantee you when you stand before God, He sees things differently than you do. And God does not anoint flesh. He didn't choose many mighty people, many great people. The reason being, He wanted to get the glory. He delights in choosing weak things, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are nothing. And you know, this is one of the reasons that it was so easy for me to just throw myself on the Lord and turn myself over to the Lord because I had no natural talents. I had no natural abilities. I was an introvert. I couldn't look at a person in the face and talk to him. I was fearful. I had nothing going. I had no confidence in my flesh. And when God touched me and showed me what he had done and showed me that I was changed on the inside, man, I didn't have anything to hold me back. I didn't have anything to lean on. I was able to just totally throw myself into God. I'm going to let you live through me. I'm going to minister out of the power and the ability that you give me because I didn't have any natural things. Those of you that are really talented, in a way, it's harder on you than it is on me. Because I just trust in the Lord because I hadn't got anything. If God doesn't come through, I'm dead. <laughs> you know what, Jamie and I, we were so poor we couldn't pay attention. We struggled. We had all kinds of problems and now we're, we have all of these needs. And it's just so far beyond me that it doesn't keep me up at night. Because there's nothing I can do about it. If God doesn't come through, I'm dead. <laughs> If God doesn't supply the needs, I can't do anything. I remember back when I first got started in the ministry. I, I told this someplace recently. I don't think it was here. It must have been at the Sowers. Sowers Conference or something. But back when we first got started in ministry, we had a lot of financial problems. And anyway, I'm a lucid dreamer. And I had this dream where I just decided I'd quit and go join the Air Force. And I'd pay off my debts that way. And when I dream, I, it's hard for me to tell if I'm awake or asleep because they're so real. And anyway, when I woke up, it was on a Saturday morning. I was laying there and I thought, oh, man, praise God, that was just a dream. I didn't do it. 
And I was just going, oh, thank you, Jesus. And Jamie leans over and she says, you know, we aren't in such bad shape that you had to quit and go join the Air Force. <laughs> and man, for just a second, fear hit me like, oh no, I really did it. <laughs> I've been talking in my sleep and she heard me. <laughs> and she, she said that to me. But anyway, see, back then, I worried about it because if worse came to worse, I could quit the ministry and I could go pay off $10,000 or $20,000. It might have taken me a while, but I could do something about it. But now we're at a place that we have to have over $5 million a month. And if God doesn't come through, I can't quit the ministry and go pay off my debts. And so it's easier for me now to just go to sleep and say, God, this is your problem because I can't fix it. But as long as you think you can do something about it, that's when you struggle. Did you know it says over in um, James chapter 4 and 1 Peter chapter 5 to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And it says casting all of your care upon him because he cares for you. Those aren't separate things. You are not truly humble unless you've cast your care over on the Lord. If you are worrying about things and taking care for things, there's a reason those verses were put together. If you're worrying and trying to figure out how am I going to get through this thing and you can't sleep at night, you haven't cast your care about it over on the Lord. And one of the reasons, there's many reasons, but one of them is because you may be such a talented person that you think you can do something about it. It's just nice to reach a place where you're in over your head and God, I hadn't got a chance. I'm going to go to bed. You can handle this. You're going to be up all night anyway. I'll just let you deal with this. It really is beneficial to come to a place where God, I am nothing without you. Jesus said this in John chapter 15. He says, abide in the, in the vine because without me, you can do nothing. It didn't say you can do a little bit, but not enough. You need my help. No, it says without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. As in nothing. Most people do not have that biblical worldview. You really have a higher estimation of your flesh than you should. Paul said that I have no confidence in the flesh. And then he goes on to say, now look, this isn't because I'm a zero talent guy. He says, man, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was circumcised the eighth day. I did all of these things. He says, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am all of these things. But what was gained to me, those I counted lost. Yea, I count all things. The word count there means to take by force. In other words, this isn't a normal way of thinking. It's not natural, but he, because of the leading of the Holy Spirit, took by force every thought captive and he counted every great accomplishment in his life but dung so that he could know Christ. And Paul was really gifted. He spoke multiple languages. Paul was one of the most educated men of his day. Paul had, th and this is back when not very many people had an education. Paul was one of the leading guys. He could have been one of the greatest rabbis in all of the Jewish nation. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, the number one rabbi. He was in line to be the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had everything going for him, and yet he counted it all but done so that he could know Christ. And he says, I have no confidence in my flesh. And yet there's people right here that God loves you. I love you, but you just really think you're awesome. And that's one of your biggest problems is that you only use God when you come to the end of yourself. You wait until you crash and burn and until all of your thinking has, has played out and then you're going to trust in God. That's not the way that you need to live. You need to recognize that without God, you are dead in the water. You have no hope. And that's a positive place to be. It's really a good place to be. And when you do mess up, and you will mess up because you are human and you aren't perfect. Paul said, I haven't obtained yet, but he's still pressing for that one thing, for the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The guy who wrote half of the books in the New Testament says, I'm not perfect yet. If he wasn't perfect yet, you aren't perfect yet. You are going to make mistakes. And instead of when you do something wrong and you lose your temper or you say something you shouldn't or 
you know, all of these things that happen to us, instead of you just falling apart like, how could I have done this? You'll recognize, man, I'm back to trusting in myself. I'm back in the flesh. Your spirit is perfect. Your spirit never sins. Your spirit never gets discouraged, never has a problem. If you are discouraged, if you sin, it's because you are in the flesh. And it helps you to understand. It's like flying in a plane. And you get to thinking, look what I'm doing. I'm at 35,000 feet. I'm going 600 miles an hour. I'm awesome. You aren't awesome. That plane's awesome. And it's your position in that plane that enables you to do that. If you don't believe it, step outside of the plane and see how well you fly. You will drop like a rock. And you need to recognize that it's only when I'm in Christ that things are going good. It's only because of Jesus that things in my life are going good. It's only because of Jesus and the way that he's made a difference. My whole life is dependent upon Jesus. And when you come to that place, it's a position of strength. Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when I am weak, then am I strong. When you are strong in yourself, when you are thinking, God, I got this. I can handle this. I'll take care of this. Then you're weak. But when you say, oh God, I'm weak, then you're strong. You know, we got Byron Hamilton here someplace. Are you here, Byron? Are you here? Somewhere over here. He helped start our um, Australian ministry over there. And I remember we were in Australia and it was the night that we were getting ready to announce the start of our office over there in Bible school. And Byron came to me in the afternoon and he says, I can't do it. He says, I don't think I'm up to it. I can't qualify. And uh, I said, man, that's great. <laughs> and I remember Byron thinking, what? And I said, as long as you don't stop there, recognizing your inadequacy and you go beyond that to saying, God, I can't do it by myself. I've got to, I've got to have you. That is a position of strength is when you go beyond your limitations. But a lot of people never get to that place. They just think, Oh God, I've got this man. I am so talented. You're going to use me. You've got to get a biblical way of looking at yourself. Our world is making you think that you're just awesome. And the only way that you can come out awesome is for you to compare yourself with other people, to blame other people for all the mistakes in your life, not accept responsibility. And you continue to be a victim. You'll never be a victor as long as you are a victim. So the Bible does not teach that you are awesome in yourself. You should have no confidence in the flesh. Look at this in Ephesians chapter 2. And in verse 1 it says, Then, or excuse me, that's Galatians. That's a good one, but Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Did you know most, there's many people... I say that we'll say, God, I'm not quite like this person over here. I wasn't a total reprobate. I wasn't destitute. I just needed a little help. Did you know there's nobody that's just partially dead? When you're dead, you're dead. We were all dead in trespasses and sins. That meant that you were lifeless. You had physical life. You may have felt like you were good compared to other people, but compared to what God intended you to be, you were separated from him. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Every one of us. Some of us were, you know, there isn't such a thing as being really dead and other people just partially dead. You, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Did you know every one of us before we got born again had a spirit, a demonic spirit working in you? And some of you think, oh no, all of the demons are in Africa. We don't have demon possession here. If you aren't born again, you got the spirit of the world working on the inside of you. And it may be sophisticated and you may be functional, but you were demon possessed. You had Satan in you. You had the spirit of this world working in you. This is what the scripture says. 
In verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation. That means actions in time past. In the lust of our flesh. Lust is demonic. God didn't make you to be a lustful, hateful person, but that corrupted nature that we were born with, every one of us has lusted. Lusted for people of the opposite sex today. It's lusted for people of the same sex. And people say, I've got an attraction towards other men. Well, man, I've had an attraction towards other women. But that doesn't mean you indulge it. It's the devil. Amen. Just I, who cares what you lusted for? It's wrong. It's demonic. I'm preaching better than you're listening. I'm countering a lot of thinking here. But this is the reason that people come up with the conclusions and the actions that they have. It says we all had our conversation in times past. In the lust of our flesh. If you have ever lusted, that was the devil inspiring you. It was a spirit working on the inside of you. It's your flesh. And you don't have to just lust for sexual things. You could lust for money. Colossians 3, 5 says that covetousness is idolatry. If you have wanted, oh God, I sure wished I had a house like that. I wished I had a car like that. It's idolatry. It's what Colossians 3, 5 says. All of these things are demonic. So much stuff that we just uh, embrace today and think it as being normal. Most of us have let this world establish what normal is more than the Word of God. And we have embraced concepts and attitudes that are just offensive to God. Your flesh is not good. You've got to war against the flesh. Paul said, I keep under my body. I mortify. The word mortify means to kill, to deny, to resist. You've got to recognize that if you just do what you want to do, not talking about your born again self, but just your natural self, if you indulge it, it'll lead you into sin. It'll lead you to death. It will destroy you. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's said twice in the book of Psalms. And notice the terminology. The end, singular, are the ways, plural, of death. It all has one end, one destination. There's many ways. You may go through different things, but it all ends up the same place. And it's death. If you are depending upon yourself and leaning under your own understanding, you are missing God. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, Proverbs 3, 5. And lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. One of the keys is quit leaning upon yourself. Quit using your own reasoning. You know, Kerry talked about it. I think it was this morning out of uh, Exodus chapter 33 where the Lord said, I will go with you and I will bless you. And, and Moses said, if you don't go with me, I'm not moving. That was a man who was committed to God. He knew that in himself he couldn't do it. He wasn't going to take a step without having God, without being God dependent. We do things our own way and then we mess up and then we run to God. No, God, help me. And, you know, he loves us and none of us are perfect. And so he has to help all of us. Nobody does everything perfectly. But, man, so much of our problems comes because we don't have a biblical worldview about ourself. We, we think we're awesome. I've actually taught on this before. And I remember one woman that came to me and she was highly offended because she was she was awesome. She was anointed by God. And she was talking about who she was in Christ. And she couldn't understand that there, there, although, yes, we are a born-again person, we also have this flesh. And you aren't pure spirit. I'm going to talk about this in the morning. In the morning, I'll talk about who you are in Christ. And it's awesome. But you've got to also look not only to who you are in Christ, but you've got to look to the hole of the pit that he saved you from and recognize that he didn't save you because you were such a jewel that he had to have you. He couldn't live without you. You were awesome. No, you were pitiful. He saved you because he is love, not because you are lovely. If you read Exodus, I mean, um, where is it? Ezekiel chapter 16 
He's talking to the nation of Israel and he said, I didn't save you. I didn't single you out because you were better than everybody else. And then he begins a comparison, a word picture. He says, you were like a child. And in the day that you were born, you were thrown away by your mother. You didn't have your umbilical cord cut. You were wallowing in your own filth and blood in the dirt and in the sand. And I came and I took you and I cleaned you up and I did this. God didn't find us as somebody who just enriched him. He came to us because we needed him so much, not because he needed us. Did you know that the great revivalist, Finney, Wesley, um, Jonathan Edwards that caused the great revival, George Whitfield, all of these guys, there was a 70 year revival in the 1700s and that's what caused this nation to be quoted sermons, I forget how many times, 300 and something times in the Constitution. They quoted sermons. This nation was birthed through a revival. And did you know all of these great revivalists, you know what they used to do? I used to take real offense, especially at Jonathan Edwards. He had a sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it's online. You can go read it. I've read it. And Jonathan Edwards, he was such an introvert. He was one of those weak things. He didn't have natural abilities or great oratory sp skills. Jonathan Edwards was nearly blind. He had big old glasses like Coke bottle and he would write his sermons out word for word and read them. And because he was nearly blind, he would put his thing in front of him and he would have to read it like this. And just every once in a while, he'd look up and point. And he, they said that when Jonathan Edwards preached that sermon, sinners in the hands of an angry God, he was preaching about how ungodly we were and how we had violated the things of God. He would preach about hell and people would literally think that the earth was opening up and swallowing them into hell and they would grab hold of the pew in front of them so hard that their knuckles would turn white and people would begin to scream and cry out to God for mercy. And here I am preaching the grace of God. And most people will say, well, that's not good. It's good if you let people know that in the natural, by yourself, this is what you deserve. Now, through Jesus, we've been redeemed. And I'm going to give you the positive side of this tomorrow. I hope you come back. <laughs> but it is true that apart from Christ, we are nothing. We deserve wrath. We deserve judgment. And what they would do is preach like that for 30 days or something and they would get people under so much conviction and like, oh God, there's nothing good in me. Then they would come back and preach on the grace of God. And you know, I really believe that unless people come to the end of themselves, they don't really become dependent upon God. And there's many people that have never come to the end of themselves. They just think, well, Jesus, he's now going to add to my life and make all of the things I'm doing and my great ability. He just adds like a little sauce on the spaghetti, just a little icing on the cake. He just makes my life a little bit better. No, you were a mess. You were headed to hell. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You didn't have anything good in you. you some of you, well, I did too. I was better than this person. See, you have to compare yourself to somebody else. You compare yourself to Jesus, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Every one of us was headed straight for hell. You were going to split hell wide open and you deserved everything that God could give you. And if you don't agree with that, then you don't have a biblical worldview. I've been telling you, this is what the Bible says. There's only one good, and that's God. You aren't God. You aren't good in yourself. You caused God to have to send his son and die for you. 
until you get this attitude, then you're going to have an exalted opinion of yourself. And you know, the scripture says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Only by pride cometh contention. Proverbs 13, 10. Did you know most people today would say, oh, that's not true. It's not my pride. Matter of fact, I was in Pueblo 25, 30 years ago and I was teaching on Proverbs 13, 10 and a little Mexican guy walked up. I mean, like a military guy. He walked up, he was mad and he started putting his finger right in my chest. And he said, look, I've listened to you most of the time and I agree with you, but you're saying that it's pride that causes contention and strife. And he says, I'm an angry man. He says, I get in trouble all the time, but I am not a proudful man. He says, I have such low self-esteem. I think I'm no good. That's not true. But see, it's because he defined pride as only arrogance. Pride is just self-centered, just being focused on yourself. A shy, timid person is a super proud person. You are constantly thinking about yourself and thinking about how am I going to look? Am I going to say something that would embarrass me? See, this is what paralyzed me and kept me from getting up in front of people. God had touched me. I had something to say, but I was worried about what everybody was going to think about me. And I remember one time I ministered and a man walked up and he said, you know, you got some good things to say. And he says, if you ever got more concerned about the people you were ministering to than you are about yourself and what they thought about you, you could be a blessing. Wow. And man, that's like a dagger in my heart. But it was true. And that's, if you are a shy person, it's because you are constantly fearful that you are going to do something wrong. And maybe you've been born again out of a miraculous situation. Maybe you've been healed. Maybe you have things that could change people's lives, but you wouldn't dare get up and say it. Because what, what if I say something wrong? That's pride. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're better than everybody else, but you are just self-centered. And it says only by pride cometh contention. Proverbs 13, 10. It's the only way. It's not the leading way. It's the only way. Only way that contention comes. It is not what people are saying about you or doing to you that makes you angry or hurts you. It's how much you love yourself and value yourself that makes you angry and causes you to get hurt. If you were dead to yourself, you can take a corpse and put it up here in front of me. I could spit on the corpse. I could kick the corpse. I could ignore the corpse. I could insult the corpse. And if it's a corpse, it won't respond. If you're responding when people do things to you, it's because you are alive to yourself and because you love yourself. Scripture says we love not our lives to the death. Self-love, self-promotion is Satan's inroad. It's his beachhead in your life. It's how he gains access to you. You wouldn't be bothered by persecution if you just didn't love yourself so much. If you didn't care about everybody loving you and thinking you're awesome, you'd just do what God told you to do. But the reason so many people, man, that, you know... I've had, I've had many, many, many people come and say that God told them to come to school, but, and then they give me all of these reasons and it, people wouldn't understand my family. All, You know what? If God Almighty, who has a universe to run and millions of people crying out for his attention and God Almighty talks to you 
and goes to the effort to speak to you and then you're going to debate whether you will do it or not? Man, I just don't even relate to that. If I know for sure that God would tell me to do something, I'd do it if it, if it cost my life. And you may say, well, that's easy for you to say. Well, I've done it. I quit school and got drafted knowing that that was going to be the result, and I didn't care. If that's what God told me to do, I'd do anything. And I got drafted and sent to Vietnam, and I faced death. I've already done this. I'd do it again. For you to sit there and say, well, God told me to do this, but you're going to debate whether you do it? What is wrong with you? You think you're somebody special. You are more concerned about yourself. You need to get to a place where you're a living sacrifice. And God, if you say it, that's it. Yes, sir. I'm not God. You are. What do you want me to do? And you just do it. I'm telling you, it's our self-love. It's our promotion of self. It's our desire for self to be loved. It's all of this self-esteem that this world is promoting so much that is Satan's inroad into your life. You die to yourself... And it just frees you up to be alive unto God and to do whatever God tells you to do and you just don't worry about it. Well, people are going to make fun of me. People hate me. I guarantee you, you need to look at things in the long term. Someday we're going to stand before God and all the people who ridiculed you, all of the people who mocked you and said, you're a religious bigot, you're a, all of these things, they will be on their face saying, Jesus is Lord. And they'll be confessing that he was right and that they were wrong. And you're going to shine like the sun then. You need to think long term. And it doesn't matter if people ever recognize what you're doing down here. Man, even if you give a cup of cold water to somebody in the name of the Lord, you're going to receive a reward. But most people, they just love themselves too much. They're fearful that it's going to cost them something. They're afraid to stand up and do it. And the root of all of that is just self. Did you know that this happened to Adam and Eve? Satan convinced them that you're missing out on something. They were missing out on something. They were missing out on sickness and disease and depression and hatred and all kinds of problems. But they weren't missing anything that was good. But they leaned under their own understanding. It made sense to them. The tree looked good. It was... Pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. And so they leaned under their own understanding and thought, my wisdom is better than God's. You know what they did? They exalted self. They exalted their desires above God's. And that's what ushered this entire human race into sin. I'm telling you, your love for self, your promotion of self is one of your biggest problems. We've got to come to the end of ourselves. And, you know, I've ministered on this before, and I've had people come forward and say, all right, just cast self out of me. <laughs> I can't. The only way I can get rid of self is I could kill you, and you'll be instantly in the presence of God, and that old carnal self will not dominate you anymore. You'll be perfect. But as long as you're in this life, you're going to have a self. And what you've got to do is learn to deny yourself and to exalt God. And it's not just... Uh, all right, I'm going to deny myself. No, the way you overcome self is to get so full of God, you love Him so much, you forget yourself. This is what happened to me when I had that experience March the 23rd. God showed me what a religious hypocrite I was and that all of my righteousness was as filthy rags. And in front of my best friends, in front of all of the leaders of the church, I confessed anything I had ever done. And I had been living a relatively holy life compared to other people. So I hadn't gone out and done a lot of things. But the Bible says if you've lusted in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. If you've hated in your heart, you're guilty of murder. And so I started confessing every person I'd ever lusted at, every person I'd ever been mad at, every wrong thing I'd ever thought about the people that were there. And I ruined any reputation I ever had. <laughs> and I just came to the end of myself, and I was waiting on God to kill me. I thought he was going to kill me. But did you know what? When I finally just, in a sense, threw up, all of this self and admitted it and saw it for the first time and I was waiting to see what God's response was, I had a tangible love of God come over me and for four and a half months I was just caught up in the presence of God 
And I was so in love with God that I literally forgot myself. And that's the way that God helped me to start getting over it. I'm not saying I've totally conquered self. I've heard people say that, that, man, I've died to myself and I don't have any problem anymore. Man, you can write Ichabod over that person. <laughs> the glory has departed. Because as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to have a self and you have to deal with it. But you have to start the process. You have to at least see that the way that the world is promoting it, that you've got to have this positive self-image and feel great about about yourself and that you're better than other people. It is an ungodly, non-biblical attitude. If you ever saw yourself as nothing without Christ, it would take away your judgmental attitude towards other people. It would solve a lot of problems. It takes away self-salvation. It takes away pride. It takes away strife. Because only by pride comes contention. And I'm telling you, this is, this is a biblical attitude. Now, if you just stop right here and only recognize your unworthiness and your nothingness by yourself, you can get destroyed by that because you'll just be condemned thinking, Oh God, I'm nothing. How could you ever use me? But you have to go past that into, even though I can't do it by myself, I can do all things through Christ. See, in most people, it's either one or the other. You're either going to sit there and, oh, God, I'm nothing and I'm nobody and I can't do anything. And that by itself is necessary. But if it's by itself, it's wrong. You've got to balance that out with even though I can do nothing. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But the good news is, I am never without Jesus. Right. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. And so I don't, it's wrong for me to say I can't do anything. I, I, it'd be okay if I said in myself I can't do anything. But man, I'm not in myself. Christ lives in me. I'm in him. And through Christ I can do all things. And you have to have these apparent opposites in balance to really release the power of God. If you just get to thinking that, man, you're awesome... It will stop the power of God because he will not share his glory with you. You're only going to get the results that you can produce on your own. But if you're over here saying, man, I can do all things, not through Christ, just I can do all things, that's not going to work either. You got to get to where I'm nothing, but through Christ, I'm everything. You need to have a superiority attitude through Christ, but an inferiority attitude in yourself. Amen. Amen. And those things need to balance each other. I tell you, this is not what you're going to hear very often, especially not from church, but it's necessary. You need to have a godly biblical opinion of yourself so that you don't trust in yourself and get lifted up in pride. Amen or oh me. Amen. Father, we just receive this word tonight. Thank you for the truth of the word of God. And I believe that people that have been influenced more by the world and they're just always trying to make themselves awesome and they haven't seen themselves in Christ but just in themselves they think that they are special. Father I pray that you'd help them to do what Paul did and take every one of those thoughts captive and count all of the things that were gained to them as done compared to what Jesus has done on the inside of them. That Father they would exalt you and not themselves. 
that they would come to the end of themselves and recognize your great goodness in just loving us, not because we were lovely, but because you are love. Father, I thank you for speaking this into people's lives here tonight. The Bible says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. There are some of you that need to humble yourself before God. You've never really done it. You may have called out to God when you come to the end of yourself and beyond your abilities, but you've never just reached a place where God, I'm nothing without you. And you need to humble yourself. You need to make yourself a living sacrifice to God. Praise God. Man, that's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. You know, how many of you here tonight would say, man, this was for me. I didn't see myself this way. I had an inflated opinion of myself. You know, if that's you, I want you to just stand right where you are and I'm going to pray for you and we're going to humble ourselves and we're going to start this process of depending upon God and who we are in Christ and not ourselves. Now, this could apply to everybody to some degree because none of us have 100% conquered the flesh. You don't ever, it doesn't ever just die and be gone. You have to manage it. You have to constantly deal with it. But if this is new to you, if this is something that's a revelation and you've never seen it to this degree and you want to humble yourself, I'm asking you to stand. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for all of these people who are standing. And Father, we want to have a biblical perspective of ourself. We want to look, yes, to the rock from which we are hewn and see the great things that you've done. But Father, we want to recognize the hole of the pit that we crawled out of. We need to recognize our unworthiness so that we could glorify you and trust you even more. And I'm asking that the Holy Spirit would take what they've done. The scripture says if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that you will lift us up. Father, we've humbled ourselves tonight. These people are standing and saying that we've been trusting in ourselves, exalting ourselves more than we should. And Father, we've done what your word says. We humble ourselves. And now we ask you to exalt who we are in Christ, that we would start trusting in you more, that we would walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. I just pray that this is a turning point tonight. And Father, that this revelation will sink deep down into our hearts. And that, Father, we won't forget this, that we will begin a process of learning to depend more and more, to become weak in ourselves and strong in you. Father, I believe that. I believe that you are doing this for all of these brothers and sisters here. Thank you that... The end of ourself is the beginning of you and that this is going to release.